Well, it's one o'clock Central Standard Time, so I think we'll go ahead and get started since we have a, a full um, exciting agenda for today. A couple of housekeeping items before I get started here and hand it over to our presenters. Uh, this is Jessica Crejo with the Iowa Coalition for Integration and Employment and a member of your Employment First Leadership Team. We're so excited to have everybody here today for our June Iowa Community of Practice. Today we're going to be talking about supporting job seekers, employees, and businesses during COVID-19. And as you saw the teaser on the slide that was up, talking about not the new normal, but better than the new normal. Uh, so we look forward to hosting some national speakers today as well as some local presenters. Uh, just really excited to have everybody. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. We will be recording today's webinar and we will be sure to share that recording along with any presentation materials um, or resources afterwards along to the mailing list. If you're not a member of the mailing list, just reach out to me either via email or here in the chat and I'd be happy to add you. Um, all of our webinars are stored on our Iowa Coalition for Integration and Employment YouTube channel, as well as housed on the IVRS website under the Partners tab, Employment First. You can get all those webinars all the way back to 2014. So just doing amazing work for six years now. So go back and check some of those out. There's some good stuff there. Um, if you would like a certificate of attendance for participating today for your CESP or just ongoing training needs, um, again, just reach out and let me know. Email me at pruittjess at gmail.com. I'll be sure to put that in the chat as we move along here. There is captioning provided for today's webinar. And I put that live stream text uh, link there in the chat. So if you need that in order to participate today, it's right there for you. So I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce our presenters today. We're really lucky to have some national um, presenters as well as locals. So we're just really excited to have everybody. And as you can see on your screen, we've got Sean Wood, who is the Senior Project Manager for the Washington Initiative for Supported Employment, as well as their Executive Director, Cecily Colson. Um, the Washington Initiative for Supported Employment, or WISE, has been a longtime friend of Iowa. I had to go back and look at my Instagram today, guys, to remember when we first came out to Washington. And it was way back in 2000. 13, if I've got that right. And we collaborated together for the Recruit, Train, Retain. That was in 2014 and 15, I believe. I think I got that right. Um, so the state of Washington and WISE has been a longtime partner and mentor of Iowa, and we're just really happy to have them. Um, if you don't know what WISE is, they're a leader across the nation in providing innovative consultation, training, and technical assistance to individuals, families, providers, educators, um, states, and their systems, um, just all across the country to promote equitable employment for people with developmental disabilities, or really any disabilities for that matter. Um, again, they've been a longtime friend of Iowa, so we're really happy to have them. Uh, Sean and Cecily are gonna share uh, with us some of the things that they've been doing to respond to and support providers, job seekers, and partners um, in states during COVID-19. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over um, so they can share their uh, words of wisdom with us today. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Cecily Coulson. And um, just so you all know, I do have a little bit of a sun patch coming in. This is good news coming in through my window today. I'm uh, actually working from the San Juan Islands, which is the northern most tip of Washington State. Um, for those of you um, that don't know, we can I can go to one side of the little island that I'm on and I can get a glimpse at Canada and then I can go around to the other side of the island which is about a two mile walk around the whole place where I'm at and I can look south and I can see um, the uh, Cascade Mountain Range all the way down south of Seattle to Tacoma. So I'm on this little tiny um, island for my, my COVID work site. So I just wanted to let you know that's, and, and it's sunny today, which is really, really wonderful. It's been raining really hard here, a true Washington summer so far. But um, anyway, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes to 
kind of bring our states closer together, hopefully, and to share a little bit of our world out west here. Uh, as you all probably know, when when COVID descended upon us, Washington State uh, came out of the gate pretty strong with a lot of uh, cases that hit some some residential care facilities in our state and very quickly put us on pause um, as a community and. Like all of you, we've gone through our iterations of um, understanding and um, rearranging our lives and rearranging our work and trying to be as responsive as we could the whole time. And I'm just going to speak a little bit today um, personally on kind of the framework that we've been in at WISE and also in working with community partners like this through Zoom all across the country. Um, just to kind of set the conditions for what Sean's going to talk about. And um, he and I have got to do this in a few other states and be with groups like yours. And it's been really a nice way for us to bring in some things and for us to learn some things. And I, I know that's our intent today is um, to have this be um, both the sharing and um, a shameless stealing of any ideas that we get from you. Uh, because what I've realized since this started and actually, I didn't realize in the first couple of weeks and is kind of in a leadership perspective was that I thought we were going through a natural disaster kind of an experience where I framed it and with our team as I kind of I think I used um, the analogy of a hurricane and what you need to do when you have to keep your boat at at the dock and batten down the hatches and weather a storm. And fast forward since the first week of March to now. Um, the analogy um, is the reality of a long-term crisis, and it's always um, a wonderful thing when you open a training to have just a, a downer sort of a thing to say, but um, I've also learned to speak truths and realities and to stay present uh, as of late as best I can, and that's kind of how I'm framing things for us as an organization and in the work that we're doing with other organizations is um, buckle up we're in for a, quite a ride for a while and that's going to mean that um, we have two ways to go and i think we're going to vacillate between uh wanting to jump up and down and stomp our feet and long for the days of yesteryear juxtaposed to um being calm patient open and looking for opportunity and seeing opportunity and seeing new things that I quite frankly didn't think I'd ever see in my uh, professional career around virtual communication, trying to have tried to redefine inclusion. Um, I think the second point I'd like to say after we're in, a, in for a long term crisis is I think we're in for a um, grand opportunity to retool, reboot, and reorganize ourselves in a way that meets the broader range of need. And so I know today John's going to try and keep us in that lane. Um, of thinking about what we are doing to try and expand employment and try to um, include more people in our communities. And uh, a couple of things for me um, in that is that I, I've had to tell myself the one thing about supported and customized employment um, as practitioners and uh, lifelong professionals is we know one thing really, really well, and we know unemployment really, really well. And so I want you all to think about what that means to you today when you're listening and when you're engaging. Um, we've got a gift to give to our communities. We know how to break down tasks. We know how to problem solve. We know how to meet new needs. We know how to find new needs for employers. Um, we are a resilient lot by nature. And we're also a really uh, calm, patient sort of crew when it comes to playing a long game and things. And uh, I think all of those, all of those traits are not only important right now, but I think we all need to elevate ourselves as a uh, remedy for the situation that our communities are in right now. I think we need to hustle out there. I think we need to be in the business conversation at all of the tables we can get at saying, here we are, we have things to share that we can help you with. And I think the spirit from which we can build our communities together uh, couldn't ever need us more. Um, and we cannot miss this opportunity. We just can't. We've got to grab this one right wherever we can grab it from whatever role that you're playing. 
and share what you know. Because every single person out there right now needs customized employment to do their job really well. And you guys are the ones that know how to teach them that. So think, try and think about opening up as best you can. Um, and think about this. This isn't the last thing I'm going to say um, before I lob over to Sean. But when we talk about inclusion in the disability community, we've always said all means all when we're talking about trying to get employment for every single person that wants that. And that is no different right now than what's happening in our communities around racial equality, is that we're talking about all means all. We're talking about uh, the American dream. We're talking about um, trying to ensure that we all have a fair shake at things. And we can never be in a more interesting time where all of that's weaving together for us. And again, just remember, this community has been training for 50 years to be at the front of the line to do something. And here we are, right? How many more people can we get into employment? How many more uh, communities of color can engage in our services? And I'll leave you with this one fact. You need to figure out in Iowa well, what the demographic is of how many people are accessing supported employment community by ethnic group. In Washington State, we like to pride ourselves on employment, but 85% of who we serve are people of um, a white background. And we are um, actually really have a narrow field. We have in King County and Seattle alone, 142 languages spoken where um, our headquarters are in our office. And WISE this year is going to do our best job to try and get that, that pie shaped in a way that represents our community. Um, so I just put that challenge out there to all of you to say, who else can you partner with? this year? Who else can you help with employment? And let's make sure that all means all, okay, when we're talking about inclusion, um, diversity, equity, and the full gamut. So um, enjoy your time with Sean today. And I can't thank the Iowa crew enough for bringing us in. It feels so good to be back with you guys today. And uh, I look forward to more time together. So cheers from the San Juan Islands today. Thank you so much, Sess. This is our moment. Yeah. I'm here for it. I'm ready. Um, I'm also thrilled to be uh, here in Iowa. I don't know. I think I've shared with you before, but I used to live in Iowa 16 years ago. I lived and worked uh, all across the state, and I was based out of Dubuque, Iowa, um, which has the biggest hills in Iowa, and they actually even have a, an elevator there, which I lived right at the base of. Um, I'd love to see if anyone's on, on chat. Uh, is anyone from Dubuque? Love to remake that connection. It's been a long time since I've been in your state. Um, so uh, this is, uh, hopefully you see my screen right now, this is what social distancing has looked like for me. This is the beach that's close to, to my neighborhood. Um, if you ever have a chance to visit uh, us here in Seattle, um, if you want to see where I live, you fly into the airport and then there's this little strip of land that's right between the water um, uh, uh, and the airport, and that's where I live. Um, so being that I'm there, I just want to acknowledge I'm coming at you today from uh, the traditional land of the first people of Seattle. Of course, that's the Duwamish people who, are, who we are named after, Chief Seattle. Um, and we honor them, past and present, um, the land and the people themselves. Um, as I say that, I just wanna take a moment to, to recognize that um, this virus has had an outstanding, um, uh, uh, an outsized effect on native population um, uh, in, our, in our community. Um, we've, we've had over um, 118,000 deaths here in the United States, and um, there's a disproportionate amount that's affecting not only people of color, but, but the indigenous population in, um, specifically. My hope is that we find peace uh, in remembering the people that we lost uh, while holding on to their memories while we build that, that new normal, hopefully a better future. And I also just want to take a moment to recognize that um, this is an unprecedented time that we are experiencing as a country. Um, in, my, in my city, um, in your state, um, with the challenge of managing our services uh, and supports in the face of the pandemic and now the protests against police violence and racism, uh, I just, we just want to acknowledge the real emotional impact that this is having for um, a lot of people in our community. Um, I hope everyone out there is taking care of yourselves, lifting up your community and staying safe. And just to get us underway, let's remember that our work, um, as Cecily reminded us, is rooted in the firm belief that all people deserve respect, dignity, and self-determination.
So I'm going to ask you this question twice, um, and I want you to think about it. So once now and, and once uh, again in a half an hour when I've shared with you a couple things. Um, what are the features of a better normal that you want to create? And what do you need to make that happen in your community right now in Iowa? What are the features of the better normal that you want to create? What does it look like? Uh, this is a, a, a painting that was done by my friend and uh, colleague Emily Harris. Uh, this was this is what quarantine has looked like for me. Um, me and my husband, surrounded by all of our, our animals. Um, I, I got started doing this work uh, maybe 18 years ago, um, supporting people with disabilities. I worked as a tutor for for small kids, uh, little kids with disabilities. I worked in uh, school settings. I worked in uh, residential settings. I was a preschool teacher. I worked in middle school. Uh, I served in the Peace Corps for um, uh, 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 three years in Eastern Europe, uh, working primarily with uh, uh, Roma people. Um, we call them gypsies, they don't like that word. Um, uh, they prefer the word Roma. Um, and uh, my secondary assignment was working in institutions. Bulgaria and Romania have the highest per capita number of people institutionalized anywhere in the world. Uh, most of those are children. And uh, things are changing. I was in the country this last year, uh, last summer, and uh, they are now embarking on deinstitutionalization. So they were building the first group homes in, in the country. And I got to see the first support employment um, uh, uh, project uh, happen in that, in that country, which is really, really neat. So things are changing. Um, I've been working in employment for about 12 years now, and I just celebrated my seven year anniversary at WISE last week. Uh, so time flies when you're having fun, you're with good people. Um, I work at WISE, I do three things. I work with people that are looking to expand their services or looking to get unstuck from tricky situations. I work with schools, you know, it's uh, really trying to make sure that the last couple years of school look remarkably similar to the first couple years uh, after school. Um, and then I work with organizations. So, um, organizations that are looking to expand their services um, and to do new cool things in the community. Um, so the question today, how does distancing um, and learning how to be together while distancing improve our service? Uh, hint, it lets us reset our priorities just a little bit. So let, let me start by framing just a few definitions here. Um, hard skills. We're, we're really familiar with hard skills because these are the skills you gain through education, training programs, and on-the-job training. And there's just like specifically like quantifiable skills. Um, so like for me, a new hard skill of my new job here being a, a, a virtual worker is using Zoom. So, so using Zoom is a hard skill that's now required to work at WISE. Um, other examples here, IT professional might be computer programming, um, carpenter might, uh, might be knowledge of wood framing. So then of course we have soft skills. So soft skills um, are similar to emotions um, or insights that allow people to read others. These are a lot harder to learn, at least in like a traditional classroom, um, but they're the skills that are needed to uh, communication abilities, um, how you interact with a person, your relationships with other people. And then of course we have executive functioning skills. So these skills include planning, making choices, time management, impulse control, and organization. I wanna be very careful here because what I'm, while I'm talking about executive functioning skills, I am not talking about functioning levels. Um, functioning levels is when, and you might've heard this in your work, when someone says, oh, that's Sean, he has the brain of a 12 year old, or you know, that's Sean, he's functioning as an eight year old. Um, that is not what I'm talking about, and that philosophy does real damage to people with disabilities because it doesn't recognize their true lived experience, um, and in fact, it delegitimizes it. That is not what I'm talking about with executive functioning skills. When I talk about executive functioning skills, I'm talking about all those things that that are around the soft skill, or sorry, around the hard skills that let you uh, plan your day so you can do your job. I think that we sometimes overfocus on hard skills and thus lose the opportunity to practice soft and executive skills. Um, 
Further, I think that the world right now is having a, a, a renaissance in um, executive functioning supports and soft skill supports. This is a, a picture that I got from uh, a friend of mine uh, who works in the field who was supporting um, essential workers out in the field when she got a call from her son's teacher saying that the son was her son was not doing any of his work. So they set up a self-management system where uh, he removes uh, a rubber band that corresponds color-wise to the um, uh, uh, subject that he has to do. When all the rubber bands are removed, he gets to play with his Xbox. Now, I'm going to give you another example. This is a personal one. Um, uh, this is a picture of my uh, liquor cabinet. I hope this is appropriate for, for this group. Um, uh, this might be a situation that you're familiar with, that, that our partners and the people that we live with become better at our jobs than we are. Um, my husband installed a, 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 a light on a timer on our liquor cabinet that turns on at happy hour and turns off um, when happy hour is over. Um, just a little, little piece of, of the way that the whole world is thinking about uh, supports that we can build into our homes as we get used to this, this new um, normal of, of working from home. We're going to look at some strategies, but I first just want to mention this concept of normalization. Normalization comes up in, in two places in our work. One, we think about some historical ideas about some of the first times that, um, that, that groups in North America were introduced to the idea that people with disabilities can be out in the world, um, away from institutions, away from segregated environments, and working alongside, living alongside the community. That is a use of the word normalization that's used quite often in our field. There's another definition of the word normalization that's used from more like the, the activist class of our field. And it's this idea, um, and it's a more of a negative connotation, that sometimes our service seek to make someone look and act normal as opposed to um, allow them to be themselves. So I just wanna be really clear as I'm sharing strategies that we are not doing this to create strategies to compel disabled people to look or act less disabled. Rather, we are creating supports with people to help them meet their goals. The distinction here is, is soft. It's, it's, not, it's not always um, a bright line between um, creating strategies that make your job easier um, uh, by making someone look less disabled um, and working with someone to create supports that help them meet their goals. The check is, are you working in partnership? So one, are you working with partnership to help people set their own goals? And two, especially in this time where we've got a little bit more time to, to figure out um, uh, at least a virtual connection, are you working with people to help uh, in collaboration build those supports? Those are two checks that will help to make sure that um, you're helping to make supports that reach people's goals. So I'm gonna present, what I'd like to do today, I'm gonna to present, I've, I've, I've been working in a couple different places around the country, um, um, all beamed in from uh, my little office here. Um, and I just wanna share with you some things that people are doing um, that are helping to connect people to employment, that are helping to people to stay safe um, and understanding what's happening in this time of COVID and this time of protests. Um, uh, and I'm setting it up as potentially billable activities. Now, every single state and locality has their own, um, uh, you have your own relationships with the funders. So, so I can't tell you if something is definitely billable or not, but in my experience, funders are much more open to creativity, um, and, um, and some non-traditional ways of doing things in this time, if you are able to talk about how your supports are um, connecting people to employment, connecting people to the community, helping them stay safe, and fourth, helping people move back to work eventually. So all the strategies that I'm going to share with you meet all four of those criteria. And if you want to use them, it's up to you to figure out how you tell the story in your case notes and your service plans of how your supports meet those uh, categories. So the first one I want to talk about is virtual assessments. How have you been connecting with people? Um, I've uh, participated in a number of virtual assessments with people um, uh, during this time. And you know, uh, what I want to stress is that 
while we're assessing hard skills in the home, and these hard skills that I've seen have been stocking the pantry, doing laundry, a variety of stuff that happens at home, right? Do we care about those hard skills? Yeah, a little bit. But really what I'm, what I'm focusing on when I'm working with employment consultants in these virtual assessments is what tools are you using to communicate expectations to the individual? What tools are you using to work with that person to self-manage their, their time with the task? What tools are you using to help that person know when they're done? Um, and how are you tweaking these tools over time as you engage in multiple virtual assessments to see what works for that individual? Um, it's an opportunity that I think a lot of people might not have had the, um, the time to, to really engage with um, to see how those supports uh, um, really operate. And if you emerge from this time, um, this COVID pandemic time, and whatever that looks like, and whenever that emergence is, whether it's um, uh, next week as my county is going to be moving to a new phase of reopening, or if it's in January or February when we have uh, hopefully have a, a, a vaccine that's available, whenever that is, whatever you learn now in terms of those soft and executive skills to support somebody are the same skills that will help somebody learn the new, their new normal of using personal protective equipment, um, maybe reacquainting themselves with the job. These are all skills and, and, and tools that you can use to help meet those ends. Potentially billable activity number two, virtual mock informational interviews. These have been incredible. I've got this coworker, hopefully you'll meet her someday, Debbie Moore. She is um, such an amazing person. She single-handedly has developed hundreds of jobs in partnership with, uh, with Rotary um, over the time that she's been here at WISE. Um, and what I've seen her doing in this time is connecting with her job development contacts that she's, you know, that her, her virtual Rolodex that she's been playing with you know, those people are staying at home too and, um, and are looking for ways to engage with their community. She's connecting those businesses with um, uh, school districts and job seekers and letting people either have a mock interview, so practice interviewing virtually, and the advantage of having a virtual mock interview is that you can record it really easily with this Zoom platform, and then you could show the person what they look like, what they sound like, and that will help that person become a better interviewer. You can also do the flip of this with an informational interview. You can, um, um, I'm seeing people locally in a couple of our agencies um, stay connected to their job development network. And when I think about job development network, I remember my times as a job developer. These are the people that you're like close to getting a job with, but you're not quite there yet at landing or that customized job. You keep them connected by introducing them and giving them opportunities to connect to their community. So what these agencies are doing are they're uh, either requesting informational interviews where they learn about and they work with their job seekers to learn about different fields and different tasks um, or they go on virtual tours where they just take the phone and give the person a tour of a, of a job site. So many amazing things that you can be doing um, with this right now and, and if you are doing this and, and there's cool stories that are coming, um, please share them with me because I would love to hear the ways that you're, you're, you're virtually connecting with folks. I'll make sure you have my email by the time I, I'm done here today. Um, potentially billable activity number three, social narratives. Um, social narratives, these are things like social stories or social comics, uh, power cards, and social autopsies. Most, most commonly, it's the social story is what you've heard of. I'd love to see in the chat box, if you could just pull up your chat box real quick and just say yes or no if you have used um, social narratives, social stories in your work, in your practice. For me, these have a lot of long-term potential. This is one of my favorite tools, okay? Easy, effective, person-centered, um, uh, and transferable. I want providers to use them more. When I'm working with individuals, when I'm working with teams, this is one of my primary tools to be using. And anything that you develop now, anything, I want you to save these copies so you can use it as a template for the future. Track what works about the story and what, is, um, what wasn't effective. Let me give you a couple examples here. There's really, there, there's two ways. So oh, it looks like there's a lot of experience with social narratives, awesome. And for those of you that don't, these are really easy tools to use. I'm gonna give you a couple examples and I'll make sure that I, I share them with, uh, um, as handouts as well. Two ways to use them. One, before a transition or a new experience to help someone understand what to expect. Or two, 
after a social challenge has occurred as a way to understand what happened. So I have two social stories that I did not build that are um, that that, it, that have been shared with me that I'm going to share with you um, that relate to this work. But first, I'm going to show you one that I did build. This is one um, that I was working with, and I built this with PowerPoint. And um, many of you might not have used uh, PowerPoint recently. Um, uh, if you have, you might have noticed that there's a uh, design feature in PowerPoint um, that really seeks to make your PowerPoint look real professional. So this might look like it would take hours to do. This took me about 30, 35 minutes to build, so it's really quite easy. We used to have to spend significant amounts of money on specialized software to build um, social narratives, um, but now you can use it with whatever, you know, you can use, you know, your documents, you can use a slide, your slide program, whatever you have available to make something. So I used PowerPoint for this one. And I was working with a young man. Um, I changed his name, of course. Uh, Jared was being reintroduced to employment services before COVID um, and had a hard time trying something new. So we wrote a story about him trying something new. Um, we also, when I walked into his house for the first time, we had incredible stuff everywhere. So I remember um, you know, 18 years ago when I first started working with adults, there was this idea of like age appropriateness, right? And that I would never use smiley faces, for example, with an adult. Um, now, fast forward 18 years, we have entire languages that are built off of um, uh, emojis. In fact, Samsung has a pilot project right now that seeks to translate between emojis and the English language. And I've seen, um, so, so this idea of what is age appropriate is kind of like blown up for me. Um, so the check for me, is if I'm gonna use something that might be considered less age appropriate, I wanna make sure it's okay, first with the person that I'm serving, and then if they have a guardian or a family member that's intimately involved, I wanna make sure that this is okay. And this was with them. So I asked, um, I asked, uh, um, he loved uh, Incredible, so I asked him to draw a picture of uh, Elastigirl, she's flexible. I asked um, him to draw a picture of himself as Elastiboy. And I'm not gonna go through all of these here, but what was key for him with this story is for us to tell him what to expect on this informational interview and then when he's going to be done. Um, so one thing that gets, uh, that can get some people in trouble, any of us, right? If we don't know what it is that we're going to do, what's going to be expected of us in a new environment and when we're going to be done. And maybe like a side note to that is how we can end things early if we need to. These are all things that if we, backed up and got ready for, um, we, we would uh, avoid a lot of sticky situations in our work. So for this guy, um, we really were key to focus on um, what he could do to calm down. And I won't go into any of his barriers right now, but, but calming strategies were necessary for him. And so the first thing I did is ask him, Jared, what do you do when you need to calm down? And he was like, you know, Oh, well, I draw a picture, and on the left, he was drawing a picture of me as an incredible character. I still have it on my wall. Um, he's like, sometimes I look at pictures on my phone, I read about sharks, or I do my breathing exercises. So I took a picture of him doing every single one of those, included it in the story, and then we also have this as a standalone visual support that he can use um, to, to um, remind himself of his different strategies. Um, okay, so I want to share with you a couple of resources. Uh, you'll get a copy of this PowerPoint. New York Times recently had an article on how you can make your own digital comics with free or really, really cheap, um, like two, four dollar apps that allow you on your Android phone or your Apple phone to make your own social comics. And then there's a lot of resources out there on social narratives for COVID and the protests. So I want to share with you two that I came across that um, I think you'll really like. So switch this over. This first one is, so I want to be very clear, I did not make either of these. These, um, and these are available on um, your, you'll get this as a resource. So this is, an, this is a story that, that tells somebody what to expect during COVID, specifically I think this is a transition student. So it just gives people information. And if you were to build something like this for the person that you support, um, you would tweak it and you would find what is, what is the best method, what is the best strategy, what is the best um, methodology to use 
um, building these that, that gets your point across to the person so they can stay safe and stay informed. And that tool is what's going to be helpful um, when we re-enter work. Here's another one I found um, about George Floyd. Um, so you might be in a situation where you need to explain why people are protesting and why people are angry. Um, I'll include this one uh, with you as well. So, so this is a different example where you've got um, uh, more like PEC style pictures, maybe from Boardmaker, if you have access to that or worked in a, in a school district that have uh, aligned with words. So it's accessible from a word perspective as well as from pictures. So hopefully you find, hopefully you find that helpful. Go back to my PowerPoint here. So social stories um, can be quite easy to make. Um, you first just need to define the situation for yourself and kind of map out what's happening. Identify the target of, of your goal of this. So what, what are we looking to communicate? Um, and we want to keep things simple. So you don't want to try to communicate too many complex ideas at once. Because um, really you're trying to figure out what works with these supports. Then I want you to work with the person as much as possible to, to find out what's relevant in metaphor. So what are the metaphors? What are the special interests that would really help someone be attracted to the story? Um, what do things feel like for that person? And what are some alternatives that that person can, can do in situations that are challenging for them? Um, then you might wanna think about, am I gonna use first or second person? In the, the words that I use, you might notice that in the story that I built, um, I used first person language. So that is, my name is Sean. Today I'm going on an interview. Interviews could be scary. This one would be great because my job coach will be with, well, whatever, right? Um, and the reason why you are considering this is because some of the people that you work with might experience what's called echolalia. Echolalia is when, mm, it's, it's like when you meet that person and you say, um, hi, my name is Sean, what's your name? And their answer is, what's your name? It's that, that need to repeat what's happening. And, and the re repetition isn't always verbal. Sometimes it's, it's a thought. So if I'm gonna write a story for somebody that experiences or that I suspect might experience echolalia, I'm gonna write that in first person. So if they're repeating it, it's I'm going on an interview, not you're going on an interview. And then again, you want to use pictures, icons, words that are relevant for that person. We've got a couple of on-demand trainings on social narratives up on our uh, uh, WISE on-demand library. Um, and you can access that at our website, uh, gowise.org. And then the Autism Internet Modules, which is autisminternetmodules.org, um, is another free resource, which is great. Um, for, for learning more about social stories. Potentially billable activity number four. Um, so, um, I, I, I think that there's a lot of video that are being used um, uh, in your state, um, but I'm not sure. Um, can you use video modeling to teach someone something new? Does the person want to learn something new around the house? Can you explore the best ways to construct that video to help that person learn. Um, variables to consider are the perspective. Is this third person view, like that God view, or is it like a point of view uh, perspective? Uh, is it good to have the video at normal speed, um, uh, slow down, sped up? Is it good to have sounds turned on? Is it helpful for the individual to have music that they like? What is the appropriate length? How can we incorporate family or other services into these videos? I'm not giving you these um, variables as a way to confuse you or to give you a ton of work, but rather I've been hearing from quite a few people who are stuck and like, how do I support somebody at a distance? Well, these are all questions that you can answer as you build different types of supports to help you distill what is the best support that I can build for somebody. So if you have the time to, to dig into these, um, these are great questions to know because if you know the best speed, the best type of sound, the best length, the best perspective, when we restart employment or if you already are restarting employment services, you will know how to build these in a way that is most efficient for the person that you're serving. Um, potentially billable activity number five, marketing. Can you update your marketing materials to include video resumes? 
Can you involve the person in service by teaching them the skills to make their own video resumes right now virtually? Absolutely, yes you can. So one app that I've been using, oh, I was gonna have it pulled up, let's see if I can. I've got five minutes, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to um, make these videos. So the app that I recommend is called Quick. It's done, it's made by GoPro. And um, like many things that we've started to use in our service, it is not designed specifically for us. It is designed um, really so you can take all your GoPro footage and um, build a, a video of your uh, vacation that nobody will ever watch, right? Um, but what it does, it uses artificial intelligence to make your videos look uh, better um, than, than they really should look. So I've had this experience where I've built videos for people and they're like, oh, you're such a, such a great, uh, um, oh, it looks like I can't share my, let me try it one more time. So I think if this, this app is so powerful in the way that it makes videos. Um, a lot of people that I work with think that, you know, maybe I, maybe I can't build a video. Maybe I don't have the skills to, to be a, um, uh, a video maker. Um, but just playing around with this app lets you do so many cool things. Six, nine, seven. I have to type in the, um, the uh, meeting ID into this. Um, okay, it does not look like I can share my screen. So I'll make sure that you have access to, to this resource when I share um, uh, my resources. But the, but the app is called Quick, Q-U-I-K by GoPro. And, um, and once you start playing around with it, you'll start to recognize different advertisements that you see in social media are built with the same um, software. So what it does is it uses artificial intelligence to make to, to find parts of your video and to make your video look really great. I'll give you an example. I made a video resume for a young man um, who uh, he's in a wheelchair and he um, he likes to rock like this. And so I made this video and the the app identified that um, that that video um, that he has is rocking, and the app selected uh, a song that um, that the beat was the same as his rocking, which made my video look so professional. And he ended up getting the job, by the way. He um, he's a, a highly skilled young man and working now for a local city. So. The point is, is that these videos are easy to make, the apps are easy to use. If you have extra time with individuals virtually, can you work with that individual that you're serving to make their own videos? Now that first video that you make is not going to be, um, or the first video that your person makes that you're serving is not gonna be like the most incredible video in the world, um, but it doesn't need to be, right? Um, I encourage people when they're learning this new video software to, to kind of step outside of work for a second and make something funny about your dog checking the mail or feeding the chickens in the backyard, whatever it takes, right? Um, because if it's about your personal life, um, you'll be maybe a little bit more tuned in to trying something new. Um, another app that I, I recommend people trying is, is called Google Keep. Um, it's a free app. It works um, on uh, iOS and Android and on your computer. And I got introduced to this from transition programs that we're using this to, um, it, it's a grocery list app. It's not, it's not designed again for us. We use it at my household. We've got um, our grocery list on it and uh, I share it with my husband. And so when I check something off at the grocery store, he sees it in real time that I've checked it off and he can add something to it. The other cool thing is that um, I can set it up. So it's, it, it plugs into the GPS on my phone. So when I walk into my favorite grocery store, my grocery list will just pop up on my phone. So what I'm seeing providers do is they set people up with um, task lists and pictures that show up automatically on their device when they walk into their, their job or their internship site. So this is another great tool that you can help people stay organized right now um, at home and you can support them virtually. And if you have a little bit of extra time, why not spend time learning how to do this? Because once you restart work, you'll be able to do your work uh, remotely. Um, the final app that I wanted to recommend um, is Habitica. Um, uh, it's a self-management app that uses nerd culture. And by nerd culture, I mean like vintage video game sounds, um, uh, dragons and wizards and um, traditional board game elements 
Um, and I got introduced to this by a, uh, a teacher in rural Alaska, one of these places that you can't drive to, you gotta fly into. And this teacher was having particular challenges around um, power plays and dynamics with the people, with the, the students he was serving. And so his solution was to turn to a self-management software, Habitica, for students to set their own goals. And they get to set values on each meeting the different benchmarks to their goals. And each time you meet a different benchmark, you get to add a new element to your character and you build up this world in Habitica. Um, so it, it is not going to work for everybody. Um, but if you find yourself um, in power struggles with people that you serve, this might be a good app for you or for the person that you're with. And then I'll finally just leave you with this idea of technology access, because I think that we can use this time to rethink the way we do technology supports. It's incredible to see uh, systems now allowing uh, virtual services to be considered direct service. Um, our system has had challenges in the past to allow people to have access to technology that does a lot of different things. Typically, assistive technology is about solving one problem, one very significant problem, and that technology is usually uh, um, civic for that individual. We're moving into this concept of applied cognitive technology, which will help some, which, which we define as helping someone function in inclusive environments, to increase participation in inclusive environments, and to promote social inclusion. And when we use this definition, things open up, um, uh, you know, things that give you access to social media, um, music making software, all these things that can increase um, social inclusion can, are, are now, um, at least in my opinion, considered um, assistive technology. So your last um, potentially billable activity is can you help people access technology um, that will help them work remotely, organize life, and connect to a community? Um, I'll leave you with this. Remember that just because some of us are staying home and we're staying physically distant does not mean the community is gone. It means the community looks different. And our task is now to make sure that the people that you serve are also included in that new community. So um, as we move on to our other presenters for the day, I want you to think about answering this in the chat box. After listening to some of the things that I've shared with you, what are the features of the better normal that you wanna create? And I want you to share with your community what you need to make that happen in the state of Iowa. Thank you so much. I'll make sure you get access to all my resources. Um, and hopefully I get to meet you in person someday. Uh, I would love to reconnect with, uh, with, with um, my Iowa friends. You live in a beautiful, beautiful and important uh, state in this country. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks so much, Sean. And I just wanted to let you know that uh, Kara and Jan, Kara's from Dubuque, and Jan works in Dubuque frequently, so they said hello oh, hey, and cool. a little shout out. Yes, so. Alice too, it looks like. Yes. Right it's such a beautiful town. I can't wait to see it again. Thank you so much, Sean. So many great resources and ideas. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hand it over to Ashley Coyle and Kathy Pittman from Imagine the Possibilities in beautiful Jefferson, Iowa. Uh, they've been participating on the Employment First project for the last two years and have been kicking butt and taking names, uh, serving job seekers right now virtually and face-to-face -face at businesses. So I wanted them to be able to come and share their ideas today as well. Ladies, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, so like she said, we've been staying busy, surprisingly. Um, what we've done is um, we work with that person. Um, we get a hold of a business, call them on the telephone, and ask them and let them tell us, do they, can we do it virtually through the phone? Um, can we come in? Um, if we can come in, do we need to wear masks? And what, what would they like us to do? So far, um, we've been able to do both. Um, we had one gentleman that we took him to a car um, mechanic shop. And he said, oh, you can wear a mask if you want to. And he said, it's just me here working. So, and people just drop their cars off. Um, and as long as you guys haven't been sick, come on in. Well, neither one of us had been sick. We do our temperatures every day. Um, took him in there and he got to, to do it. 
the same gentleman I took him to called Art on the Fly, which is a little art studio here in town. Um, she preferred to do it virtually over her phone. So we did, he come up to my office and we FaceTimed her and she did the tour of the shop. Um, it worked really, really nice. Um, he still got to see, she offered when they open up for him to come back and could look more in depth at her different items that he's seen on her phone. Um, just like Sean said, it's different now. And we have to think outside that box. And I think that that's what's helped is it's kind of opened my eyes to say, how can we do this differently so that it works in our world today? Um, and that's what we found that works. Um, a, a lot of it's listening to your business. What do they want? And, let, and hearing what they're saying. And also helping our job seekers learn about the virtual stuff, um, assisting them. You know, not all of our job seekers have um, Apple iPhones. So letting them and figuring out what apps are available for Android phones. So we've assisted a couple of them in downloading um, other video messaging that are available. We found the app um, Google Duo that was available for them to download and we've been communicating through that. Um, and it's worked really well um, to get people to communicate. Again, just a different world, uh, different, different perspective on how things work and it seems to be going pretty well. We really haven't had anybody tell us, no, get out of our faces or no, um, we don't want to meet that way. Um, we've had some pauses in our services, of course, but um, people have been pretty open to picking back up and um, keeping stuff rolling. So that's been good. The pauses have been the people actually themselves wanting to pause, not because something that we're not doing with them though. So that I've, I really found that interesting because I really thought when all this hit that it would be, we're done, that's it type of thing. But we've all, we've been to, been able to go with, uh, I would say 80, 85% of our individuals that we serve, we've been able to move forward with them. So i um, pretty pleased with it. And the, the businesses here in our, our, you know, we're in a pretty small community, only, you know, less than 5,000 people. Um, and they're, they're looking for ways, you know, to make money as well. So they're using their social platforms here as well, but they've been very open to us and, you know, letting us know, and nobody has, you know, shut the door in our face, so to speak about letting us in or, um, using those virtual platforms to let us see their businesses or, um, look around or share what it is that they're doing. They're all willing to share with us and our job seekers what they're doing and the good stuff that they've got going on. So it's pretty awesome. It's a pretty, it's been a challenge, but it's been um, a fun challenge to adapt to, to see what we're doing and to learn, to learn what we're doing. So it's been good. Any questions or comments? Perfect. That's what I was just going to say. Any questions, comments, reactions that folks want to share? Uh, with Ashley and Kathy and Sean and Sess as well. We've been here with a little extra time. Folks are welcome to kind of share what they've been doing as well. Hi everyone. Hey, I've got a question for um, for uh, Ashley and is it Kara? Kathy. Kathy, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, awesome job. It's great. It's so inspiring hearing um, you know what you guys are doing. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about how things have been. So it's cool that the businesses have been open. Do you guys think that you'll use some of these tactics for the long haul? with businesses do you think they'll be open um continue to be open to kind of the virtual connection and tour of of their place i think so um again time will tell but i i think so great 
it seems like an opportunity for us to think about defining that kind of um, or kind of expanding the definition of informational interviews and environmental analysis kinds of things. Right. Um, it also occurred to me listening to Ashley talk how, like what you were saying, Sess, about us being the experts in customized employment and how like the, the relationship has always been reciprocal, but we've always, but, but more we thought of ourselves, of course, we're, we're paid to support people with disabilities. Um, but listening to Ashley talk, you were also, you have so much information that is relevant to that business that is starting back up. Um, and just by the pre you being there, the presence, you are able to offer so much wisdom, which I think will really help reset our relationships with a lot of businesses that we work with. So again, I want to say good job as well. That, that was some great examples. Good stuff. Well, if any, if, if, does anybody have any additional comments or thoughts they want to share from our presenters or any of our attendees? You can open up your mic or share in the chat there. Give you one minute here to kind of collect your thoughts and see if there's anything else you want to share. Sean, I've got a question for you that's somewhat related to the topic, but your professional background there, you're in the sky there. Tell me about that. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I took a, um, I turned my, uh, my phone um, and took a video of the, uh, of uh, the sky above my house a couple weeks ago. Um, I am not in the clouds, of course. Um, uh, this is where I am. <laughs> so, <it's, Here>. yeah. <laughs> Which is nice too, but. Very cool background. Thank you. Well, I think I'll go ahead and help us wrap up here. Again, thank you so much, Sess and Sean and Ashley and yeah. Kathy. Yeah, just so great to have you all refreshing, re-energized. I feel like um, so many great ideas and resources. We look forward to sharing those. I'll be sure to get those out to the mailing list, along with the recording for today and the presentation materials. Um, the evaluation link is there in the chat. I'm going to copy it and put it at the bottom again and encourage everyone to please give us your feedback. We always appreciate that. Um, if you would like a certificate of attendance tip for participating today, shoot that to me at the following email, typing in, talking, multitasking. There you go. Send it to pruittjess at gmail.com. I'd be happy to get you a certificate of participation as well as add you to the mailing list. Um, we're going to be back next month, July 21st. Um, Ashley Lance is going to be presenting on facilitating opportunities for self-employment. I think it's uh, uh, definitely tied and apropos to what we talked about today, right? And we can just jump off of that and talking about self-employment opportunities. Um, so please join us again uh, July 21st at 1 p.m. I want to thank uh, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services and the Developmental Disabilities Council for their continued support and investment in the Iowa community of practice. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll let you go and enjoy the hot, humid day here in Iowa. Um, as Sean said, keep in touch. There's his email. I'll be sure to share that out too and Sess. Um, so again, thank you everybody. Uh, have a great rest of the day, and uh, we'll see you in July. Everybody take care and, and be well. Thank you, Jess. Bye, Thank you. Bye Sean. Thanks, guys, so much. Bye. Thank you, Kathy, Ashley. Take care. See you tomorrow. Bye.